In this lecture, I will go over the course goals, provide a brief history of data analysis, talk about why it's so exciting to be looking at big data and performing data science right now, and we'll look at where big data comes from. The goals of this course include learning about data science. Where does big data come from? Performing observation and experimentation. And the elements of data science, which include data acquisition, data preparation, analysis, data presentation, and data products. Another goal of the course is that you learn how to perform data science, that you understand data quality and how to clean and manipulate data sets, how to use and parse data representations, and how to use basic machine learning algorithms and libraries, and that you learn how to write big data applications and perform exploratory data analysis. The third goal of this course is that you learn to write Apache Spark programs. You'll learn about the history and development of Apache Spark along with its conceptual model, how the Spark cluster model works, and you'll learn about Spark essentials, transformations, actions, persistence, broadcast variables, accumulators, key value pairs, and the Python Spark API, PySpark. You'll also learn how to debug Spark programs and how to use Spark's MLlib library for machine learning. This is a brief history of data analysis. In the 1930s, Fisher proposed the design of experiments along with the statistical tests ANOVA and Fisher's exact test. He's also credited with a quotation, correlation does not imply causation. This is ironic given that Fisher was a lifelong pipe smoker and derided studies that showed any link between smoking and cancer. In the later 1930s, Deming proposed the idea of quality control using statistical sampling. Lunn, in the 50s, proposed the idea of using indexing and information retrieval methods with text and data for the purposes of business intelligence. And Tukey, in 1977, wrote the book Exploratory Data Analysis. This led to the development of the S and S plus languages, along with a language that you've perhaps heard of, R. Dresner is a modern business intelligence proponent. And in 1997, Mitchell wrote a machine learning book that is still a bestseller today. In 1996, two Stanford PhD graduate students wrote a prototype search engine, which ultimately led to Google. And Microsoft, in 2007, released a data-driven science ebook titled The Fourth Paradigm. Norvig proposed the unreasonable effectiveness of data. The idea that multiple small models and lots of data is much more effective than building very complex models. And The Economist, in 2010, published an issue titled The Data Deluge around the exponential growth in data volume. This is a cautionary tale about performing data science. In 1958, Ansel Keys started the Seven Countries Study, where he followed 13,000 subjects for anywhere from 5 to 40 years. Now, as a part of this study, he produced the following graph. This graph shows on the x-axis the fat calories consumed as a percentage of total daily calories consumed. On the y-axis, it shows deaths per 1,000 for degenerative heart disease. And this is for the time period 1948 to 1949 for men. And what you can see here is that it appears to be that it's the case that there's a correlation between the fat calories consumed and deaths per 1,000 from degenerative heart disease. However, this study has caused a lot of controversy. In particular, he only studied a subset of the 21 countries that had data. He also failed to consider other factors that might cause deaths from degenerative heart disease. For example, if we look at the per capita annual sugar consumption in pounds, we find that for Japan, it was 15 pounds per person per year. In Italy, it was 40 pounds per person per year. And in England and Wales, it was 60 pounds per person per year. So it appears here that there's a correlation between per capita annual sugar consumption 
in pounds and deaths per 1,000 of degenerative heart disease. So this really emphasizes the point that Fisher made that correlation does not imply causation. Let's look at several examples of why there's so much excitement around working with big data. The first is now casting. Now traditionally what people have done is forecasting. You collect a bunch of data, you build a model, and you use that model to predict the future. With now casting, you collect a lot of data and you build a model, but instead you use it to predict what's happening now. So the example we're going to use is Google flu trends. The way that traditionally we determine that there's an outbreak of the flu is when someone's ill, they go to the doctor, the doctor fills out an incident report and passes that on to their local health department which then passes it up the hierarchy through the county, the state. Eventually, it reaches the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. That process takes about two weeks, so it takes roughly two weeks to know that there's an outbreak of a flu, by which time the outbreak may actually already be over. With Google flu trends, what Google did is they started with lots of data. From 2003 to 2008, they looked at weekly search queries. And there's about 50 million of these. From those search queries, they were able to derive 45 terms that were relative, relevant to people who were searching for flu information when they had the flu. They used this to build a model. The model was very accurate. In February of 2010, it was able to detect an outbreak two weeks ahead of CDC data. Now, initially, the model was about 97% accurate. But during the period from 2011 to 2013, it overestimated the prevalence of flu, including an interval in the 2012 to 2013 period where it was off by a factor of two. That is, Google Flu Trends estimated that there were twice as many flu cases as there actually were. So what happened? What happened is Google rolled out flu stories in Google News during this period. And so now, people started reading about flu in the news and searching on those stories, either for those stories or things in those stories, and that skewed their results. Once they had identified those factors, they were able to take them into account, and the model was very accurate after that. And in fact, today, the model is being new types of models are being used to estimate which cities are most at risk for the spread of the Ebola virus. The second example about the excitement of working with big data is the 2012 United States presidential election. Now, anytime there's an election, everybody wants to know what the outcome is going to be. And you have pollsters that try to predict the outcome by polling people. But unfortunately, pollsters have biases. And these biases and errors in their polls lead to incorrect results. The challenge here is filtering out the signal, that is, the correct prediction of the outcome, from all of the noise. Some of the pollsters will get some of the outcomes correct, and some will get it incorrect. The challenge is, can we remove the biases, remove the errors from the pollsters, and correctly predict results? And the answer is yes. Blogger Nate Silver was able to build statistical models that corrected for these biases and errors, and correctly predicted the outcome of the presidential election in all 50 states. Now, it was not just bloggers that were using data science to try and analyze the election. The campaigns were also using data science. So Mr. Obama's campaign built an extraordinarily sophisticated database that modeled the behavior of the electorate. They were able to determine voters who were likely to vote for the president, but who were unlikely to actually go to the polls and vote. They were then able to direct campaign workers to go and help those people get to the polls so that they could go and vote. This is really interesting use of big data, not just because it helped win an election, but because it allowed the Obama campaign to m correctly marshal a limited set of resources, those campaign workers, and direct them to where they could have the biggest impact. The third example for, of big data that we will look at is Facebook Lexicon. This is a service that Facebook has since discontinued, but at the time it allowed you to type in various words and then see the prevalence of those words occurring on people's wall posts. So here we can see a query for the words party tonight and hangover, and on the x-axis of this graph we see time. 
The y-axis is the prevalence of these words appearing on people's wall posts. Now, immediately, without actually seeing the x-axis, we can actually tell weekends because we can see that the blue curve for Party Tonight has peaks that are periodic, followed by a slightly offset peak for the word hangover. Not surprising uh, that we see that in that order. We can also see two holidays. We see the holiday New Year's Eve, and then we also see the U.S. holiday for Halloween. We can also look at other queries for Facebook lexicon. For example, here are the words hola, ciao, and salute. And we can see the growth of those words appearing on people's wall posts as Facebook was made available in new countries and new languages. Let's look at another cautionary tale around performing data science. So in 2014, Princeton University researchers published a paper titled Epidemiological Modeling of Online Social Network Dynamics. And the paper made quite a splash because the last sentence of the abstract was, quote, extrapolating the best fit model into the future predicts a rapid decline in Facebook activity in the next few years. Wow. They're predicting that Facebook as we know it won't exist anymore in just a few years. Well, how did they come to this conclusion? They looked at Google Trends searches for MySpace. And here on the left, you see two different graphs showing the results of the prevalence of Google Trends searches over time. And you can see that there's a peak in 2008, followed by a decline in the searches. They fitted two different models to this decline and then repeated that same process with Google Trend searches for Facebook. So here you see the trends peak in 2012, followed by a, a decline. They use that to then apply the same model that they had derived for MySpace to predict the future number of trends for Facebook. And they arrive at the conclusion that since there are going to be no more searches for Facebook in just a few years, there'll be no more Facebook in just a few years. So the Facebook researchers saw this, and they had to respond, of course, firmly tongue-in-cheek. And they put up the following blog posts with the following conclusion, which is, in keeping with the scientific principle correlation equals causation, our research unequivocally demonstrated that Princeton may be in danger of disappearing entirely. So how did they arrive at this conclusion? They looked at the proportion of total page likes for Princeton, Harvard, and Yale. In the graph on the bottom, we can see that there's a steady increase in total page likes for Yale with a slight decrease in 2014. Harvard shows substantial growth up until about 2012, and then there's a, a declining trend. But Princeton shows a, a sharp decline from 2009 to 2010, with a slight recovery from 2010 to 2014, and then a, a slight decline. Looking at the Princeton search trends, they extrapolate that this trend suggests that Princeton will have only half of its current enrollment by 2018, and by 2021, it will have no students at all. Now, of course, since all of this was tongue-in-cheek in terms of their response, they went further. And they say, while we're concerned for Princeton University, we are even more concerned about the fate of the planet because Google Trends for air have also been declining steadily, and our projections show that by the year 2060, there will be no air left at all. And they produce this graph of interest in time, over time in air. Let's look at some of the sources of big data. Much of what we do occurs online, and potentially we could record Every click, so every website that you click on, every ad that you view, every billing event, every fast forward or pause while you're watching a video, like for example this course video, every request that's made from a client to a server, every transaction, every network message, and every fault. Anything that occurs online potentially can be recorded. And in fact, a lot of it is recorded, but very little of it actually gets analyzed. And that's why I have a picture of an iceberg on this slide because a phenomenal amount of data is collected, but only a tiny amount of that data is analyzed. Another source of big data is the users, user-generated content. This is a big source on the web and an even larger growing source for mobile devices. So every post that you make on Facebook, 
or every picture you send on Instagram, or every review that you write for Yelp or TripAdvisor, or every tweet that you send on Twitter, or video that you post to YouTube. Now, individually, this user-generated content is not very large, but taken across the billions of internet users, it's a massive amount of data. Another source of big data is health and scientific computing. So here on the left, we have a graph showing various repositories, Wikipedia, the Library of Congress, tweets per year, and the Large Hadron Collider. It generates more data in a year than all of the other data sources combined. In the middle, we have genome sequencing data. Sequencing data, the cost of performing sequencing, is dropping exponentially, much faster than Moore's Law. So as a result, we're collecting more sequencing data than ever before. And so you see the graph in the middle shows exponential growth in the amount of sequencing data that we have. Graphs are also an interesting source of big data. And these graphs include things like social networks, telecommunication networks, computer networks, road networks, and collaborations or relationships. And some of these graphs can be absolutely enormous. Think about Facebook's user graph. In fact, later on in this course, we'll look at a picture of the user graph. Another source of big data is log files. These are files that are generated by servers around the internet. So here's an example of an Apache web server log. And it records every click. So every time your web browser makes a request to a web server, that gets recorded in a log file. And later on in this class, we're actually going to look at a log file, and you're going to perform some analysis on it using Spark. Here's an example of a machine log file. And there are hundreds of millions of machines out there. Each machine is generating a log file like this of the applications that run, or any errors that occur in those applications, or in the operating system, or in the operating system processes. All of that gets recorded. But even, even bigger source of data, potentially, is the Internet of Things. Here's an example of an Internet of Things device. And typically, an Internet of Things device has a processor, a little bit of memory, and communications capability. It also has some sensors and sometimes some actuators. So here at Berkeley, one of the research projects built the Internet of Things device you see in the upper right, which is a little sensor moat that measures humidity and temperature. And they put those into the redwood forest that we have here in California at different heights in a redwood tree. Now, taken individually, each sensor generates a very small amount of data. But imagine the amount of data that gets generated from an entire forest full of these sensors. Here's another example of an Internet of Things device, an RFID tag. This is a California Fast Track electronic toll collection transponder. And we use it here in California to pay our tolls on the highways. But it's also used to collect data that's used for traffic reporting, because they put sensors that measure these transponders all over the highways. Now, what can we do when we have big data? So let's say we have crowdsourcing. We have lots of users that are collaborating to provide data. We combine that with a physical terrain model and sensors which could either be road highway sensors that are embedded in the roadway, or they could be individual users' phones running mapping applications. We then assimilate together all of that data, and we can produce a picture like the one you see here at the bottom. This is a map of the city of Berkeley showing the traffic in the, in the city. And what's interesting is, even without seeing the underlying physical model, you could see what the major arteries and, and traffic ways are in our city.